Amen. This is another one of those times where I breathe in the prayer, God, don't let me ruin this. <laughs> don't let
let me get in the way of your Holy Spirit working. Um, you know, there is no l- lasting living hope outside of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? And that's not just sentiment speaking. That's biblical truth. We're going to see a little later where, where Peter talks about that living hope. And in Acts chapter 4, when challenged, he says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There's, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Let me ask you a question. Where is your hope today? What is your hope in? Who is your hope in? How sure is that hope? How sure is it? If your hope is not in Christ. When I say hope, I mean your confidence. We were singing that song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Yeah. Do I get that perfect all the time? No, but the fact that He is my Savior, I am His, He is mine. The rest of the days, the days of this life and forever in glory. That's biblical truth for every child of God. But as I go into each day, do I praise Him perfectly? Do I get it right all the time? Not all the time. But is that how I roll? That's how I roll. That's how I roll. Because Jesus Christ is my Savior. He is my assurance. He is my hope. Is He yours? Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 as we continue on in our studies. The life and times of Jesus, according to Luke's gospel. We made it down through 12 verses last week. Can you believe that? I mean, we finally got done with chapter 9, made it into chapter 10, and then we smoked it. Cleared 12 verses, just boom. We're going to slow down a little bit. We're going to slow down just a tad. And next week, even a little bit more. When we look at just verses 21 through 24 next week. That's that's the plan. Lord willing, that's the plan. I, I strive to be just attentive to the Holy Spirit's working and obedient to His working. Uh, and it seems like it's His good pleasure and desire to continue through Luke's Gospel. Why do we start with God's Word and, and expound upon God's Word? Because God's Word is living. And through the preaching and the teaching of His Word, He calls and He draws. It's a means that the Spirit of God brings Revelation, the Spirit of God brings illumination. It's, it's God's means in calling His elect to Him. You don't need just another flowery, social, warm, fuzzy story. There's plenty of those on the Internet. You need the Word of God. I need the Word of God. And that's why we preach and teach the Word of God here. Because it has the power it has the power to quicken through the Spirit. It has power to transform your life. So for the 40 minutes that I have, okay, somewhere around the 40 minutes that I share with you, and I'm the clock's ticking as I'm talking, um, I, I want it to count. I want it to count. So Luke chapter 10, verses 13 down to... To verse 20 today. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum? Who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. Some word it this way. And you, Capernaum, thinking you're going to be exalted to heaven? I don't think so. You're going to be brought down. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. (laughs) Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. 
nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather, and some translations omit rather, but rather rejoice because your names is what, church? What's it say? Are written in heaven. That's where our focus is to be. That's where our joy is to come from at the fact that, yeah, when this feeble life is over, I'm going to glory. And Jesus was encouraging them with that. In this life, you will see difficulties. You will see tribulation and struggles. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what we were singing about, right? Oh, when when on that day, when they came and the tomb was empty, the victory was vividly displayed. That Jesus' power defeated sin. Jesus' power defeated the grave. Where the Apostle Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's been swallowed up. So you and I live, if we know Christ, we live with this, with this eternal hope. And that's how we roll through our days here until we're forever with Him. Isn't that glorious? I think that's glorious. Let's pray. Father, thank you for time together this, this morning. And you know my heart, and you know all of our hearts here. You know what's gone inside. And I, and I don't want to ruin this. I pray I haven't yet. I, I trust in you, I trust in your word, and so just keep me out of the way. Let your gospel go forth today. Let us see, let us see uh, the good news and the bad news about your word going forth. Let, it, let us see what a, what a sure and certain hope, promise, promise was sealed on that day we arose Help us to see as children of yours, we have hope. We have your promise. That you will see us through this life till we're forever with you. Uh, God, I pray that, you, that you, your spirit, blessed spirit of God, minister to our entire being this morning, our minds, our affections, our will. Spirit of God, call. Spirit of God, quicken. Make alive today in this very service. May your goodness lead people to repentance, to act on that quickening, that awakening by repentance and by faith in Christ. God, work in a mighty way for your glory and your honor, for the, for the calling of the lost, the, for the building up of the child of God, the encouragement of the child of God. And Father, I, I thank you and can rest that uh, your word never returns void. You will accomplish with it what you will. Do so as you see fit, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, uh, exceeding joy and, ex and inescapable judgment. I don't know if, yeah, I forgot the joy. <laughs> exceeding joy. Joy should be in there. All right, just, just, just fix that on your own bulletin. Exceeding and escapable judgment is true. That's a, that's a true statement. But I want the child of God to rejoice today because we have hope. Right now, tomorrow, if he gives it, we, we have a living hope. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll just start sending my notes to you Saturday night, and you can edit them and send them back, just like Kristen does with the blurb. So, all right. Now. As you look down through this, you may not see it right away. And the little blurb last night, and it's going to get little or smaller, or we're just going to give title and a, just a quick snippet of what's going to, what the service is going to be about. Sure, we're going to do that. But anyhow, you know, many people, they, they see the goodness of God. God's loving. God's caring. God's forgiving. He's long-suffering. He's all those things, right? And he is all those things. There's no question about that. And so they want to just, a lot of people just want to accept it that way. And because God is, is all those wonderful, incredible things that 
there's not really going to be a judgment, and there's not really going to be a day of reckoning. Not, there's just heaven. Hell's not a real thing, and so we're all good to go, basically, as long as we're not some mass murderer or some terrible crim- criminal, we're, we're, we're okay. Doesn't it seem like that, that that seems to be uh, the mindset, or at least my observance of just listening to people talk? And the Great Commission, we only see the positive of it. We see, okay, yeah, let, let's share the good news about Jesus. And we leave it with, uh, well, you can take it or you can leave it, and that's, that's it. But when we look through this passage of Scripture, we see woes. We see warning here. And rightfully so. And, and to remember that this is Jesus speaking to the 70 or the 72 that he sent out. So this isn't just some whacked out preacher telling you these things. This is the word of God. And Jesus uses real examples, real cities that once were in place and then cities that were actually there at that time. He used them as examples for warning. So when we think about the gospel message, do we often think about warning? We should. I listened to uh, John MacArthur this past week, uh, a couple from Sproul, the late Sproul, Alistair Begg. That's my feeding. I read, read, read. I listen, listen, listen. I pray, pray, pray. And you'd think I'd do a lot better come Sunday morning. But anyhow, the reality is this. That when God's word goes forth, It does accomplish what it will. And really, with gospel presentation, it should not be left at, so this is how it is, take it or leave it. No, we see there's warning here to leave it. Right? So let's let's just look at this uh, this morning. Uh, Look at, in your Bible, we started with verse 13. Really, rightfully, we need to go back to verse 10. And just read, just uh, here he is, he's adding more. Look at 10 and 11, okay? But whatever city, now who's he talking to? He's talking to the 70 or the 72, whatever it is. And scholars really don't know, it makes no difference. But whatever city you enter, and and we won't go into the why two, we did that last week, but two are better than one, Ecclesiastes tells us. There is encouragement there, there is accountability there, and and just two are better, plus the whole idea of witness. This isn't just me saying, oh, we're in agreement here, just like in the Old Testament, two or three witnesses, okay. But whatever city you enter, and they do not receive. Now, this is Jesus speaking. If you have one of those Bibles that has red print, for Jesus' words, if you do, and I remember an old, a pastor years and years ago, well, it's all God's word and red print shouldn't be in there, whatever. Okay. Whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you like that. You don't want to hear it? Just like Paul in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas. You don't want to hear it? You don't want to hear it? Know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. You know, and and just listening, especially to MacArthur, about the warning part of after sharing the gospel. Well, that's okay. You know what? That's fine. What are we leaving them with? That it doesn't matter? Do you say, I'll pray for you, rightfully say? Do you say, well, I still love you, rightfully so? But I agree, there needs to be. But you need to understand, my dear friend, to reject the gospel message has its consequences. And we'll get to that rejecting part as I look at a couple verses. We look down to verse 16 in particular. Then he says this in verse 12, but I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. What city? (laughs) The city that has people, God's messengers, his emissaries, coming in and preaching and teaching, and they say, I don't want to hear it. And not just cities, but individuals too. So whatever city, whatever individual, 
doesn't hear the the doesn't hear now to be uh, true to the to the text to take it to the then and there before we bring it to the here and now. How many's understanding me? In other words, understanding what he was saying to them right there. Okay, so they were to go and they were to share the good news of the kingdom. In fact, they were to say, know that the kingdom of God has been near. We, we presented it. They were going, as John the Baptist was a forerunner for Christ, they were going into these cities and Jesus would follow up. Right? We get that? That's the setting. And so if they didn't want to hear it, they, they rejected their word, then okay. Now that city, Jesus is saying, is going to be held at a greater judgment, a greater responsibility, because the word of God had been given to them. And not only just a little bit, but the, for many of them, they saw the Christ, they heard the Christ, they didn't only hear the apostles and, and the 70 or 72, but they heard Christ himself. They saw Christ. See, the more you are subject to the word of God and the preaching of the kingdom, the more responsible you are for that. How many understand that? So week after week for some people. Day after day for some people, Christian radio, whatever, neighbor, whatever, co-worker, family member, every time you're hearing the word of God, you're hearing the word of God, you are becoming more and more responsible. And Jesus is saying, look, and he used uh, a city that was so wicked with sexual immorality, especially homosexuality. When you read, how many want something to read this week? Nobody. Well, let me, let me just tell you, to, that goes along with this sermon. If you look at Genesis 18 and 19, if you look at Ezekiel 26 through 28, and if you look at Romans chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians 6, how many want to hear those again? I'm tickled. There is four. A tenth. Genesis 18 through 19. Abraham's pleading with God. God said, we're, we're, we're wiping out Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going down. They are so wicked, so perverse. Let me just share a little bit how perverse. Oh, back, back to the, uh, don't want to keep you hanging. Genesis 18 through 19. Now you know why it takes 40 some minutes to preach a 20 minute sermon. Ezekiel 26 through 28. And Romans chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians 6, I'm giving you Old Testament and New Testament of how wicked and, and, and uh, wicked uh, the sexual immorality, particularly homosexuality, is in God's eyes. Now, look at this. I'm reading from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, so I guess you could add that chapter if you want. And turning, this, this is the Apostle Peter speaking. And so I've got to believe when the Holy Spirit was giving him these words to write down, that his mind would have went back to Jesus talking to the 70, uh, and they might the Apostle might not have been there, but of course aware of it, that he used Sodom and Gomorrah as an example. 2 Peter 2, 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. A lot of people believe that that's the Dead Sea area of today. Now, I don't know that for sure. I've been to the Dead Sea. You float on the Dead Sea. Did you know that? You, you can't sink in the Dead Sea. You can lay there and read your newspaper if you want. You just you don't sink on the Dead Sea. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemned them to destruction, making them an example. Uh-huh making them example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day. And i got to ask why sometimes. Sometimes there's no escaping it, you know. You're just subject to it. A lot of times that's at the workplace. It, it can be, right? Let's face it. You're in a hostile environment. You're in a filthy environment. You're, I don't mean literally filthy dirt on the floor, but I mean just, just the uh, conversation, whatever. 
it's wicked, it's, it, it's, it's perverse, and you're just subject, and you pray about getting another job, what have you, but you're subject. Well, that's how Lot was in living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And again, you read the story because there in Genesis 18, uh, God reveals to Abraham what he's going to do. And Abraham pleads with God, pleads with him. Don't destroy. Hey, if there's 50 righteous there, okay. Is there 40? Clear down to 10. If there's 10 righteous people there, I won't destroy the place. I won't bring uh, eternal, uh, I won't bring judgment, uh, burn the city up and wipe it out just like he did with the flood. Right? That was the flood was judgment. And who was spared? Noah, his three sons and their wives. And we know the story. There wasn't ten righteous there. And God did destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was. It was great judgment. And Jesus is now using it as an example. It was so wicked that the that the angels who appeared as men. As they came into the city, Genesis 19, the men of the city wanted to rape them. And they struck them with blindness. But anyhow, that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deed. Listen to this, verse 9 of 2 Peter 2, 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. He does, doesn't he? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust punishment for the day of judgment. And so Jesus is using an example. This isn't fictional. This isn't a fable. Jesus, when they heard, when the Jews heard Sodom, they just, ugh, they cringed because they, they realized or they, they knew full well what that represented. Just the perversity, the wickedness of that city. And so Jesus, this is what we got to understand. How could there be anything worse? And if anybody deserves punishment, it's those sodomites. Jesus said, well, you know what? Your, your, your rejection rivals anything of Sodom. Because if they would have had what you had, the preaching, the teaching, saw, heard, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. How many are you getting this? That the more you're subject to the word of God, the more responsible you are for it. And so, when he, then he mentions, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, those cities up in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> for if the mighty works which were done in you, and let's face it, Capernaum was his headquarters more or less. And so that area uh, the, around the Sea of Galilee, uh, Capernaum and, and uh, Chor- Chorazin and Bethsaida, those, those areas. They were subject to the word of God continually and, and to bre- Jesus' preaching and teaching and the miracles. And, and you know what? I think for some of it just grew old hat. And yet Jesus says, if the works which were done in you, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre and Sidon, two ancient cities, Phoenician cities along the Mediterranean seacoast, you can read about that in Ezekiel 28. In fact, Luth- Lucifer, or Satan, uh, uh, is seen as the, as the king of Tyre there, representing him. He said they would have they repented a long, long time ago. You see, so Jesus is saying, these, these three old wicked cities, terribly wicked, perverse, d- deprived, they're going to fare better in the judgment than you who have heard it again and again and have seen it again and again. We, we overlook this thing. We say sin is sin and hell is hell. Well, sin is sin, but there are degrees of sin. In other words, there are some that are much more uh, uh, grievous to God. And so there, there are, if you will, there are degrees of punishment in hell. Just as there are rewards for the Christian, right? How about the persecuted? Think about that in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitude. And you talk about rejoicing, because and we will get there. Where's the rejoicing part, Pastor? It's coming. You, you live in it right now if you're a child of God. But verse, 
verse 12 in, in Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Then it says in verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, there are rewards. There are rewards. One plants, another waters. God brings the increase. He alone saves souls. But he does. He does honor his labors. And I don't know what the rewards look like, and I know crowns are going to be cast at the feet of Christ. But just as there are rewards in glory, there are degrees of punishment. In other words, the more you hear, the more you are responsible, the more you will be held accountable. And I don't know how that's going to work. I really don't, and neither does really any scholar. But it is true. That's what the Bible says. So let's look at this. We need to, by the way, let me take a time out here. Uh, somebody asked me when he was coming and when I was walking by, are we having communion today? Yes, we are having communion today. And there's a little blurb in the bulletin. Who's communion for? It's for anybody who's come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Anybody who's been born from above by the power of the Holy Spirit and is a follower of Jesus Christ. Is communion for perfect people? Uh, our perfection is the righteousness of Christ. We have no perfection or righteousness of our own. If we have been born from above, a child of God, and we are living, walking in the light as he is in the light, we are, we are called to take part of the Lord's table. He wants us to. But you say, I really blew it this, this week, Pastor. I, I really blew it. Well, we've probably all blown it one way or the other. Thank God there's forgiveness in Christ. And Christ died once and for all for all of our sins. And our righteousness stands in Christ. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No, we're called to this table. He wants his children to come to this table. But he wants us to come clean. He wants us to, to ask him to search our hearts, to examine ourselves, confess our sins, and come and take of the cup. So, if you're a child of God today, you're encouraged to come and get a cup and have communion here. We are having communion, but to observe the Lord's Supper here in just a little bit. Okay? All right. That being said, let's look at our first first of several slides. Who no, it's the fair pastor. We got to get out of here. So, all right. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Wow. Do you see the power of God's word? And how it's not to be taken flippantly or lightly? And that as you and I go and share the word of God, it's as if God was sharing it. Jesus says, they hear you, they, they're really hearing me. If they reject you, they're really rejecting me. This is a warning. In John's gospel, we find something very similar. If we can have the next slide, please. The verse 47 above first says this, And if anyone hears my word and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And Jesus' first advent, his first coming, he did not come to judge the world. He came to give his life. That all who call upon him will be saved. Have you called upon him? Have you answered his call? Verse 48 says this, He who rejects me does not receive my words. Has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You see that? There is a last day coming. There is a judgment. No tin soldier rides away. You, me, everyone will see judgment. Now, for the child of God, we're passed from judgment onto life. You and I will stand before Christ, the throne, the bema seat, the great, or the, the throne of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. Those who reject, here's warning here. 
here's warning. The word that I've spoken to you will judge him in the last day. In other words, you just think of how many people have heard the gospel. And now keep in mind, just because they didn't respond now doesn't mean they won't. All right? And we talked about a lot of various sins and things already this morning. But you realize those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. And we'll talk more about that next week as we work our way down through that other sort passage where Jesus is thanking God. He's thanking the Father for revealing and concealing. And that's a paradox. But we'll talk about that next week, Lord willing. But today, today is the day of salvation. And people hear the gracious call to come to Christ. It doesn't matter what your past is or was. Past is was, right? What your life is. As he calls and he draws and people come to him, he will in no wise cast out. But we need to understand. So this is a this is a warning. This is a warning. And I like how MacArthur put it. He calls it the principle of comparative judgment. In other words, the more you hear, the more you are responsible for. The more exposure to the truth, the more guilt and punishment if you reject. And you might think, well, that's it. I won't ever come to church again. I don't want to pile up more. But, but you've got to remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But you do need to know, the more you hear, the more you're responsible for. And so... The gospel goes forth. Uh, this is a gist of, of something MacArthur said, put more into my own words. God has a message, and that message is that God has a kingdom. You can embrace Christ the Savior and embrace his message and his kingdom and find peace, or you can reject that message and experience judgment. That's just the truth of it. Let's talk about a minute about this, the matter of judgment, because Jesus just said in that verse, uh, the word that I have spoken, so God's word, uh, will judge him in the last day, because there is a last day. And so, if we can, the next slide, please. And as it is appointed for men to die once, you know, I just had a, a stray thought, <laughs> you know, the music... I felt was very exceptional today. It was, it was very well. It was very praiseworthy. And, and people can get caught up in that, you know, because it was good, very good, done to the glory of God. And it was like, yeah, I love this. But then you're telling me about rejection and judgment and stuff. This is a real downer. Th this is the truth of God's word. Understand that. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this is the judgment. It's the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sin of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. That's the good news. And when we come to saving knowledge of Christ, for the child of God, when we take our last breath here, the next breath is in his presence. It's a seamless transition. What a glorious hope. And it's not a wishful thinking hope, but it's assurance. Blessed assurance. How about it? And it is. We'll stand before Christ. We will give an account of how we lived our lives, what we did. But the matter of sin was dealt with at the cross. And so we will stand before him, really, to how we lived our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you can read that. But it's not going to be a matter of, did I make it to heaven? No, you're in glory because of knowing Christ. His forgiveness, his righteousness. Are you eagerly waiting for him? See, he came the first time to give his life as an offering. The just for the unjust. When he comes a second time, he will come as a roaring lion. He will come to rule and to reign. And he will bring judgment when he appears a second time. And salvation to all those who trusted him. Well, we're running out of time. Let's look at the next slide I want us to see from our text today. And so just a little backup, uh, because it would be improper not to touch it. 
Then the 70 returned. Look at verse 17, Luke chapter 10, verse 17. It's not on the screen. Then the 70 returned with what? What does it say? Tell me, somebody tell me. Yeah. I mean, can you, can you imagine it? You should be able to imagine it. How many of you have had some opportunities and, and you spoke with somebody and you left that with, with joy? Yes, Lord, I see you working there. And then we also have those ones where we go back, like sort of like Charlie Brown, our heads down, and we're just, you know, bummed out a little bit. But let me talk to that point, too. Okay? Because that's exactly where the evil will want you to do, where he wants you to go. I've been a failure. All I got in my bag is no treats, just rocks. And I'm a loser. And some of you peanuts people understood that. The older people understood that one. Uh, you younger kids probably don't. But, but yeah, see, see, Satan just wants you to live there in doom and despair. And you're a failure. And how could God possibly use you? And Jesus, he didn't want to burst the bubble or anything. He, he just wanted them to understand things here. Yeah, and in verse 18, he said, I, I saw Satan. They're, they're saying, Lord, they were turning with joy. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. We understand it's their power. We understand the apostles sort of failed a little bit when Peter, James, and John were up on a Mount Transfiguration and a boy with the, with the epilepsy and, they, they, and the unclean spirit. They, they couldn't cast it out, and you did. And, but we're seeing things. We're seeing marvelous things. Here. We're seeing miraculous things that you're doing in your name, Jesus. Yeah. Satan falling like heaven? You know, it's a mixed bag of, of, of thoughts on that. First of all, Jesus could have been thinking back when, when he saw Satan fall. The original rebellion. You can Again, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Those are good, two good passages to read when it comes to really Satan. He is a created being. This, this beautiful angel who rebelled and a third of the angels rebelled right with him. And Jesus looks back and he remembers that. But also, just like lightning flashes, he's also seeing the victory of Christ continue on. And so as, as demons are being cast out, the, the, the scene of Satan being has been defeated and the future and final doom for him. That every time the gospel goes forth and people respond and, and, and demon activity is squelched. Yeah, it's just like Satan falling again because he's a defeated foe but others also see that this could be a warning because they're all excited about look man we've ca we've cast out demons in your name they're subject to us the demons are subject to us yeah that's good but remember how satan fell it was pride it was pride so is he reeling them in a little bit? I don't know. That's a possibility. It's always good to be cautioned about pride, isn't it? Definitely is, is good to be cautioned about pride. But regardless, here's what he said to him, and this is what we need to see. So if we can have that, there we go. Nevertheless, and when we look at verse 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. See, he's the authoritative one. He's the power. He has the power. All power is his. And so, yeah, Satan fell originally, and, and, and the, the work of Satan, Satan is, is falling and being defeated. And the kingdom of God is marching forward. The return of Christ is coming closer. And the lake of fire is coming as well. But he says this. And some see the trample of serpents and scorpions dealing with Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy of Christ and defeating the work of Satan. But in our verse that's before you there, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Just that first part. I don't, to me, this helped me, it took some pressure off of, Results. First Corinthians three, one plants, another waters. God brings forth the increase. 
It's God that saves souls. So if I go and I share and it seems like that was a waste of time. No, no, no. I have to hold to the truth. I have to hold to the truth that God's word will not return void. He will accomplish what he will with it. So if getting, instead of getting all excited of what seemingly was a profitable time, no, i got to understand as I go forth, I'm going forth in the name of Jesus, power of Jesus, and the results are to Jesus. Leave them to him. And so I don't want to let that be my, my joy. How many is understanding that me ministering is my joy? Because I want to tell you, it's going to be a roller coaster. And it's going to have more downs than it's going to have ups. And, and, and every Christian can say that if we're, if we're on this goal-oriented, result-oriented, I'm, I'm, I'm high today, I'm rejoicing today because it seems like I'm really close to Christ and I'm sharing Him today and everything's wonderful. Mountaintops don't last long. And so really, yeah, I don't want you guys, it's great, it, praise God. The demons uh, are submissive, and you have cast them out, and the power of Satan is, is being defeated. But that's not where your joy comes from, my sister. I want your focus, I want your attention, I want your joy to come from the reality of this, the latter part of this verse, because your names are written in heaven. Because you are a child of mine. Because I called you from eternity past. Because your name was written in, in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the w- world was laid. That's how sure it is. That's what I want you to rejoice in. That's what I want you to rejoice in. And we don't have time to go into the, the, the found, uh, their names written in heaven before the foundations of the world. And before the Lamb of God uh, before the Lamb of God uh, was on this earth and was slain, as it talks about in Revelation. We'll talk, deal with that more next week. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 tells us, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame in His love. More next week. Today, the joy. The, the, the joy. This is what Peter says, if we can, please. Uh, Caden. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his what, church? If you've been born from above, you ought to see it that way. My, you have been merciful, God. My, you sure are gracious. My, you sure are forgiving and long-suffering. Why would you save the likes of me? I can tell you, he didn't save you and I because of anything that we have done or ever will do. Remember, before the foundation of the world. Our names were written in glory. It's because of his good pleasure. It's because of his will. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, next please. To an inheritance. (laughs) Don't rejoice because the demons are subject to you. Rejoice because your names are written where, church? Church. In other words, you're a child of mine. You are mine. I am yours for good. We have this, what is it, BFF? Is that, do I have the right word or acronym going on? No, we are God's children for good. Sealed unto the day of redemption. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away. Everything else fades away. Everything else is corruptible. Everything else is unde- or is defiled, but not glory. And nothing about God. Reserved where? In heaven for you who are kept by our own doing. No. That's the glory. That's the beauty of this, isn't it? I don't do anything to save me. Oh, I respond by faith, but faith is a gift from God. I'm responding to the, to the life-giving, quickening power of the Holy Spirit of God. When I repent, when I respond in faith, I'm already responding to God's work. And the one who saves us keeps us safe. But we have responsibility with that too. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed 
in that last time. Well, time's running out. One more about heaven for today. For our citizenship, where? Oh, I'm, a, I'm an American citizen. I'm thankful for that. But I'm more and more exceedingly, abundantly more grateful that my citizenship is in heaven. When they plant me, throw dirt in my face, I'm already gone. My spirit is with the Lord. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will do what? He will transform our lowly body. This is, this is, this is resurrection of the body of the saints. Our spirit's already with the Lord who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to even he is able even to subdue all things to himself who's the power who's the authority Jesus is is he calling you today is he calling you today have you have you thrown yourself at the feet of Christ here here am I I'm I'm, I'm done I'm done running I'm done trying to do it on my own I hear you, Spirit of God. Here I am. I I repent of my sins. My faith is in Christ. Do as you will. Well, how do you transition from that into the Lord's table? Well, when you think about it, There's an element of the Lord's table that we see in 1 Corinthians 11 that I think ties rather well. And if we could have that, please, Caden. The first part is about the Lord's Supper. And remember, the Corinthians had made a wreck out of it. They had made it just such a um, glutton, drunken meal, overlooking the needs of others. It was not a time of unity. It was a time of cliques, and it was just ugly. And Paul addressed them on it. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper. This is Jesus, of course. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in what? In remembrance of me. And then verse 26 is this, and this is where I see the tie. Because our our citizenship is in heaven, and we're waiting for him who will transform our lowly bodies that may be conformed to his glorious body, right? Now, we know he's returning. He will be revealed in the last time. In the gospel message and and the communion uh, verses before us here today, the Lord's table verses, he says this, for often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he what? You see that? And it's through his death, his resurrection, that sin has been defeated and that the grave has been defeated. And you and I have this living hope now. And we don't rejoice because it's a good day of ministry. And we don't get bummed out when it's a seemingly a poor day of ministry. We rejoice in the one who loves us and washed us of our sins in his own blood. That's who we, we rejoice in. And so, when we, when we observe the Lord's table, we are proclaiming, we are proclaiming the Lord's death. His death, his burial, his resurrection, his sacrificial, substitutional death, him in our place. That's what we're doing. And so, if you will, if you're new and you're unfamiliar with these things, these are portable communion cups. There are two plastic wrappers. The the first one is for the bread. And so if you're a child of God, You've been born from above. You're a follower of Jesus. You're not perfect, but it's his righteousness given to us, reckoned to our account, that makes us right before God. How does does the Father see us? He sees us through the very blood and sacrifice of Christ. That's how he sees you and I. And we're accepted in him. We're accepted in him. So as we take this bread, and Father, we do ask that you search our hearts. We do ask you. We thank you for the continual cleansing that we have in Christ. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins. And so, Father, as we take this bread, we realize and we do it with great thanksgiving, knowing that Jesus is the bread of life, knowing that that whoever comes to him, he will in no wise cast out.
So in remembrance of Christ, giving his very life for us, we eat of this bread. I often say this verse, but it's very fitting. Where in Ephesians and also Colossians, a slight variant of it is there. But the word says, in him we have redemption. That means forgiveness. That means to be purchased back. In him we have forgiveness, or we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In Christ we have forgiveness. Do you realize that? So as we drink of this cup, we do so in remembrance of Christ, who gave his very life blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so Christ died once and for all. And as his followers, in remembrance of him, we drink of that sacrament. Father, I thank you for time together this morning. I thank you for Jesus, the word who became flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of Father, full of grace and truth. We thank you for the forgiveness. We thank you for the righteousness that's imputed to us, given to us the new life that we have through him and only through him. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who brings that life and the Holy Spirit that helps us to live in accordance to your word. Father, may we continue on today in the days that you grant us as faithful followers of Jesus, proclaiming his goodness. In his name I pray.
I thank you for the truth that Jesus continues to call people to come to him. We're all sinners. We've all sinned, fallen short. I hope, Father, you make it very clear to everybody. It's not, it's not a matter of what you have done. Whatever sin that you may have committed, we've all fallen short. We've all sinned. But as Jesus calls us, he calls us from that sin and he calls us to come to him. And then in him is forgiveness. In him is life. Help people, Father, to hear that call. Help people to respond to you as you bring life. And to do so in faith and repentance and to come to Christ and to cling to him. Father, continue to go forth to t- bring your kingdom near. Continue to do that. Continue to bring people into it. May they hear your call and come. In Jesus' name I pray. And Father,